there's this time period right now in these next 12 to 18 months where it's really critical to start to stabilize and then be able to really accelerate growth. This is where we chose to apply artificial intelligence. You know, I feel like people get fearful sometimes and they, they start pulling money back for resources from the wrong areas. This is the thinking I feel like is missing a lot of times from these companies who are doing fairly well in size and revenue, but the profitability is just hurting them. And this to me is the, the most dangerous time to not pay attention to it because. Hi everybody, welcome back to this. I'm your host, Shauna Griffiths. And today is a special episode where I have asked my friend, George Swisher, who is the co-founder and CEO of changeforce.ai. I've asked him to come back to the show so if you, some of you folks remember, I had him on about seven months ago when we were talking about change force. And George, you have been busy in the last seven months with all you're doing with change force. Um, and it's really one of the reasons why I asked you to come back is because of how much we're hearing is going on in the agency space where you have so much expertise and I do as well. Um, so I really thank you so much for coming back and i look forward to hearing about all the stuff you've been up to my pleasure we had a great time last time so i'm more than back yeah yeah absolutely so folks um so as you know as i've shared with you i've had um some other of the human consultants on that are paired with the changeforce.ai software um and i have been lucky to join the team focusing on agency growth and so again, we, George and I have been hearing so much about the challenges that are um, really prevalent in the agency space and that there's this time period right now in these next 12 to 18 months where it's really critical to start to stabilize and then be able to really accelerate growth. So um, would really love to hear from you, George, George, as to what you're seeing, what you're hearing, and and what are some of the things that people in the audience really should be listening for? Yeah, no. Well, I think right now, much like we did, it's time to double down on growth. You know, I feel like people get fearful sometimes and they they start pulling money back or resources from the wrong areas. And, you know, that's a, a lot of uh, unpreparedness is what I think I'm still seeing, which is a bit surprising coming out of the pandemic years. I feel like maybe people got too much PPP money and maybe we're a little bit uh, optimistic on how things were going to go and now it's starting to shake itself out. And so that seems to be a common theme a across the board. You know, it's been interesting the last you know seven months, we've really focused on um, introducing our consulting business um, as a way to bring in more strategic dollars. You know, as a software company only, it's a different kind of business. You build something and people either love it or they hate it and they either buy it or they don't. And with consulting now paired with it, it makes it a bit more effective and the technology is more accelerant in the work we're doing. And that was a move that we decided to make as we saw coming into challenging waters that we needed to be able to hedge that a bit and make sure that there's a human element from a subject matter expert using the technology and especially with artificial intelligence, people are very fearful. I think yeah. generally it's a little bit easier, oh, make this task for me or something more simple. You know, when you're working in big strategic thinking and you're trying to predict risk and you're, you know, helping people allocate fifty million dollar budgets, it's a very different trust level of using technology. And so the bet we made was to double down and really invest behind putting some people power behind it. And it's really been paying off. And so um, to me, that's a good example of where you know, even just professional services as a whole, you know, consulting and agencies run the same way. And and for me, I'm seeing people really make not the best choices. I think they're acting out of fear versus out of opportunity. And I see, you know, when, when the climate gets choppy, that's when the people who don't have the sturdiest ships kind of sink, you know, and so that gives you a market share opportunity or things like that. So it's been, it's been interesting. And I spent some time at a bunch of the agency conferences, you know, being in that ad agency world for a while. I think it's, it's always great to get back and hear what's going on and uh, between ad forum and, you know, Ken and, uh, you know, all the different conferences that take place this time of year or just finishing up was, was insightful. And there was just so much information around AI just, blew me away of just how much concentration there is um, in that area. And I'm not sure that I've, I think it's the best way to 
push all the content out there for what people should be thinking about, but there's definitely a value to it, of course. I mean, we're in that field from a technology perspective, but it's been, it's been very interesting five months watching what's going on and four to five months with all the conferences and yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see who shakes out of it and who doesn't. I think it's going to be an interesting year. You know, there's definitely been a lot of softening in business and, mm -hmm. and and people not sure what's going on. So there's hesitation and right. that hesitation is making a lot of people um, fearful. And so right. I'm interested to see after summer kind of what happens as the, the normal kind of um, buying season and budgeting starts happening in September, you know, October. I'm curious to see what what really takes place. I think everybody is. No one knows what's going to happen. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, even speaking about like no one knows what happens, it's a good kind of segue because I, I wanted to make sure that we remind folks if they didn't hear, if they did hear it a while ago or if they haven't heard, really what Change Force is helping to um, monitor sentiment. So especially in the agency world, I know from all my years in the agency world, it's like you're constantly trying to see around corners, whether it's internally with client relationships to be able to understand how people are feeling, what's going to happen next, any risk that you can try to mitigate. And so I think that's, I just want to, again, like set the foundation that that's a lot of what we're talking about. So again, to pair that technology with that human consultant really does help move things forward. And from an agency seat, especially as a leader, it can help during those times of just that you know, not knowing and that unrest to try to create some of that stabilization. Yeah, I you know, for us with proprietary technology around sentiment analysis, it does give our consultants a leg up because they can see things before they're happening or predict them, you know, based off of, you know, what kind of sentiment is existing within your digital communications. So if it's your Slack and MS team channels or email or your project management system or your CRM, all these things that are tracking these, these meetings that we're doing, you know, the transcripts that come out of these meetings. So all these things are now readily available where, where we can match that, the content against business objectives and the ability to say, well, our business objective is to make sure that we're building strong alliances in the market community with um, like kind companies. So as they need help, they can call us as we need help, we can call them and we can actually monitor those conversations that are taking place and determine if you're doing that effectively. So I don't see that technology is the only solution. I think for us, it's a bunch of different technologies. We just happen to, to have one that's ours that really is about trying to see as far as we can, um, and predict. I think that's the, the, the challenging part for a lot of leaders, leaders is to, you have all of your you know, quantitative reports. You know, are my, is my sales pipeline going up? Is my revenue dropping? Is my profit dropping? But the why part of it is still very hard to figure out. And so when you're a small company, it's very easy to talk to all your customers, talk to all your suppliers, talk to all your employees, start to figure out where there might be gaps. As you get bigger, it's a lot more difficult. And this is where we chose to apply artificial intelligence to be able to use contextual understanding and natural language processing to interpret what's happening. And if we can map that to the things we're trying to achieve, that at least gives us some indicator to pay attention to, um, as if the snowball is melting from the outside somewhere. We just don't know where. And this will give us a little bit of insight um, on top of all the other um, analysis that you have to do in determining why the business is softening or why you're not growing or why you're not as effective in the delivery of the work for your customer or you're missing deadlines or you can't attract people. All these things are traveling around and, you know, we are just trying to figure out if we can find some indicators that don't exist right now. Um, and sentiment to me, context and sentiment is just sitting there. If the data is there. It's just a matter of interpreting it. How can you interpret it in a smart way? So that's been a, a, a huge advantage, I feel, for when we launch the consulting business. Um, it's, it gives us a leg up against other consulting firms and, mm -hmm. more importantly, even some of the internal responsibilities because we all know in the advertising world, I mean, you have billable hours, right? See, there aren't a lot of 
there's not a lot of hours that you can spend trying to figure out some of these things as leaders. You really have to make sure you're servicing your customers. You have to make sure you're winning business. You have to make sure you're managing the team. You have to make sure the quality of work is there. And that takes up 105% of your time. So where are you going to spend the, find the time to figure out yeah. what potentially is coming down the road? And I think it's a very reactive industry. And so this, mm -hmm. what I get excited about, you know, leading this part of our business and that industry for us is that if we can help people see a bit further out, make some smart decisions and really be able to prove return on investment as you make significant changes uh, without a lot of lift, mm -hmm. that's, that to me is, is where we get excited. You know, that kind of special ops type of approach yeah. to have high impact short term, but be able to predict things further out. I think that's a, a good blend of the way that we're, we're thinking and, and the the way we're applying it to kind of those three big areas that are always challenging in the agency environment. And we've been through this before, right? Over the last you know, yeah. 10, 20, 30 years, we have these lulls. And to me, you know, growth strategy infrastructure, critical part that you have to be really focused on, you know, looking at organizational effectiveness. Like, are you producing the best work, the most cost-effective way? Are you wired in a way that you really can understand p and by department to make sure that you're staffed appropriately and are you borrowing from departments? All these things, all these little nuances of what falls apart when, when things get lean. And then M&A, like really thinking about, you know, how do you strategically grow? Sometimes it isn't always organic based. And mm -hmm. when you're dealing with, you know, a climate that is, you know, a challenging headwinds type of economic uncertainty, this is a time when you actually can make some really great decisions because valuations are usually lower and cash requirements are usually less. So mm -hmm. if you're running a great business and you've got all these things firing, you really can can weather the storm better than others. That's the name of the game, right? Yeah. If you can do that, then you're going to succeed past others. And I think that's a, you turn into a, a strong market share game. You can gain mm -hmm. market share by really having those three things work together. So that's mainly what we've been trying to apply the thinking and the technology between some great subject so matter experts um, and doing a lot of research projects and trying to figure out, and we're working on one, just really trying to understand where the pain points are right. and do we have information or knowledge that we can help solve it. So I think that's kind of what I was hoping we would talk about today. It's just some of the things that we're seeing and share those, yeah. hopefully help some people kind of get through one or all three of those things. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm here to do that too. I think from some of my experiences where you see these agencies in these pain points, like basically the this almost like moment where there's so many pain points coming together and that I think that Achilles heel is just to go after, oh, we just need new sales yep. or it's the opposite of just go after new sales. And it's like, oh, we just need to double down on the existing clients that we already have. And, you know, as you and I have talked about, it's really important to be nurturing those client relationships and continuing to have the ones that you do. And you need to, to be taking the steps to gain new clients. But you know, it, but it doesn't just stop there, as you said. It's like the effectiveness of delivery, all of that. It's like this ecosystem. So what I see a lot of times is people try to just focus on one as the holy grail to fix the problem, and it never works. Yeah, I I, I agree with you, and and I've been a victim to that. I mean, you running yeah. some of my own agencies and consulting firms, and you you believe you just need more at bat. I, 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 the amount of times I hear this, I need more meetings. I just need to be in front of more people. Right. And though that's, there's a part of that that makes sense, there, there's usually as we start to uncover, there's little you know, gold nuggets that they're just overlooking. They've kept people on longer than they should have. You know, so they didn't really streamline their profitability. So they can't make investments and you know, they can't invest in more pitches where everyone's working weekends and they're burning people out. Mm -hmm. it's, to me, it's this nasty cycle of just believing yeah. that just another customer is going to solve my problem or just another $2 million account will solve my problem. To me, it solved it short term. It doesn't solve it mid or long term. And this is the time to be thinking about it and going, okay, do we actually have the right customers? I've seen people do a good job of getting rid of the customers that, that they're so over allocated that they're under servicing more profitable clients. And not that you always have to make based on profitability because creativity is a big part of it. And getting to experiment and learn things like investing in new types of working or new service offerings is important. But 
how you determine what that investment percentage is is very critical. And I, and I think this is the part of organizational effectiveness that that isn't a normal skill that people are taught in this industry. Mm-hmm. You only need to have be amazing at a craft All right. or have had an amazing role at a very notable agency um, and a business card and you're off and running, right? You, yeah. you don't really, you can win, you know, two to, I've seen 20 million dollar accounts, one on a business card, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's not a small business in this right. industry. And so, so when you, when you put all that together, you have a lot of people who just weren't really given the training or given the opportunity or more importantly, the time to learn the business side of running an agency. And it doesn't matter where you are within the tiers of the organization. The, the ones that I see you doing it best is not only does the leadership understand how to be and, and manage the company effectively. Again, it, it's not about less, ex, you know, spend less money, always make more profit. But how are you the most effective the way you run the organization? But when they trickled into the management layer and they're coaching the leads that sit underneath the management layer before the frontline employees, when they all understand and the business is wired to make sure that they're thinking about all these things at once, that's where they weather these storms. And I see a couple of them work, but I see a lot who don't. And, and I yeah. think it's just the misconception of one more client will will get us there and they invest yeah. by too much. Yeah. I hear people say that when they're even wanting to create a group, an agency, a, you know, it's like, I just need one client to get us going. And then but you can see how that can quickly just continue that cycle that you're talking about. It's just always, because you're always on that kind of hamster wheel of that one more client. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, one of the, the conference I was at, a uh, 4A's conference, you know, we were just talking about, you know, so much about artificial intelligence and so much was being talked about um, productizing services. I'm thinking about SaaS models and all these things that to me are valuable. But at the end of the day, this industry has been fairly similar over the years is that a client's hiring you to make something or to solve something with yeah. spending money on something. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you come back to it, it's like we still need to have a great craft. But the the challenge is the way that they think about running the organization and they don't think about money the way that they should. And I, I think mm-hmm. you need to have both creativity or imagination or strategy or whatever the the core of your service offering is is that if you aren't running at least a 10% profit margin, you can't even cash flow this business Mm. because the payables and receivables always are out of balance. You're paying people to work and you get paid by the client later and sometimes that gets further and further out. And so the amount of companies I talk to in this industry who don't even understand that part of the business model at the leadership level, let alone the functional managers, you know, the, the head of a balance or the head of media or the head of create, creative. Yeah. That's to me where I, I see that there's got to be a focal point because if you can make sure you're running again, that like a really efficient way you're thinking about where you invest, where you don't, making sure that you're not over delivering the customers and utilization systems are only as good as the information that goes in. And most of the time that information is 70% accurate at best. So it's more about the principles and the practices and the coaching and teaching people how to think on their feet about managing margins, about being effective in the way that they do their work. So the end can invest and go, oh, what? You know, we have an opportunity to go after a new market that's adjacent to one that we're already working in. Mm -hmm. Let's invest there and think about a growth strategy around that. Do we acquire somebody? Do we, that has that expertise? Do we you know, do we build a massive marketing program where we've got subject matter experts internally out there talking? Do we do it through strategic mm-hmm. alliances? You know, can we do it through existing customer relationships? So like this is the thinking I feel like is missing a lot of times mm-hmm. from these companies who are doing fairly well in size and revenue, but the profitability is just hurting them. And this yeah. to me is the the most dangerous time to not pay attention to it because as you're taking a beating and making big layoffs, your competitors are doing a good job or just taking market share. And then when you think about economic downturns, you know, the, the saying of all, you know, boats rise when the tide rises, yours isn't going to rise as quickly as others because you're yeah. you're sinking and they're floating, yeah. right? So it's it's how do you put yourself in a position where as things improve, you've just been able to put yourself in such a position of strength six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, 
when the markets turn back on and things are on the upswing, you are just compounding your growth. That's what you, you do at this, this stage of, of economy, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I was talking to a co-founder of an agency recently, and he was sharing that this right now, this time of stability, this where his, the revenue is flat, basically. He was, you know, feeling coming off of a few years of it being, you know, positive, really doing well. It was a bit hard to grasp and wrap their head around it. But at the same time, I was just sharing like, Again, to your point, right now, buckle down and get as like structurally sound as possible during this time. If you're flat right now, that actually can be a positive. And, you know, like use this time now to actually set yourself up to to hit that wave, like you're saying, and rise faster, better, stronger um, than the others in, that are, you know, in this very competitive space. Yeah, it can be a one step backwards, two steps forward. And and there's so many ways that it's so circumstantial. Every company is very even if it's in the same geographic market and they're, you know, two companies of the same size, even with the same types of services, the leadership style and the business acumen and some of the functional leadership they have in place and how they run the business itself is so different between yeah. the two companies. And Sometimes it's okay to be flat. It's just important to make sure that you're profitably flat. And right. that, that's where when I say a lot of times, and, and I've been guilty of this, where there's people who I hired who I love working with and just sometimes they're not the right fit for the stage of the business. And there's this whole mm -hmm. concept that you learn in mainly the technology industry is stage fit as you are you know, taking on customers, make sure that they actually fit the stage that you are so right. you can deliver the right product and you know the people you hire that they need to be a stage fit so even though it might be a cultural fit or they might be a, a role fit is it a stage fit mm -hmm. and this this is a perfect time that you can go through and you know there's a, examples out there which is called like net zero based org design so thinking about if this is the time you can say if we had to redo this is this how we would actually structure this company from right. an organizational staff perspective and in and if not, why don't we start to make these moves as long as it's a through line to profitability to make sure maintaining profitability and we're, st we're stable, let's use this time to kind of change because yeah. as there's an opportunity may come out of it that I wasn't thinking about strategically that gives us additional revenue. Um, mm -hmm. Or you have things like, you know, thinking about do you have A players and A seats? And it's this concept that mm. a lot of agencies don't realize within the hierarchy of the organization which roles are A roles, B roles, and C roles for sustainable growth of the organization. And a lot of times they, they'll have a B level player in an A role. And even though that it's the person might be great at their job, they may be a, a pleasure to work with, they might be great at mentoring people, but if they're in a role that requires it to be a certain personality or a certain functional skill that's mm -hmm. missing, it's part of what limits the growth of the organization. So this whole this whole like team composition mm -hmm. is a, another big exercise you can go to, and there's tons of tutorials out there and videos. You don't have to hire consultants to do this. If you don't have the time to do it, you bring in an expert idea that helps you. But but these are things you can do on your own. It's just thinking about it now, going all right. Instead of us over investing trying to win all new business because we feel like that's going to hedge our bet if we lose some more customers, maybe this is the time to kind of reshift the way that you're running the business and staffed and structurally set up or systems like so many companies are really bad at good processes and systems where things run like cl clockwork i mean you and i have talked a lot about kind of the sales operations mm -hmm. so even though new customers are always what people want but just the running and the management of sales people get so used to inbound or customer referrals and when that dries up and they don't have other people or other processes that are constantly, you know, making sure that they're they're delivering to the customers in a way that again is profitable, but they can cross sell and upsell and really have what I call hunters in account role. A lot of times they have service yeah. people like farmers, and sometimes they aren't the right. Again, the A seat you need is you need both of those. You need a hunter and a farmer work with your customers, and a lot of times there's only one or the other. So when I talk about team composition, these are things that you can right. really do in the short term that can shore up and 
get more organic growth from your existing customers when you put those two people in front of the customers on a consistent basis. And a lot of times it doesn't cost more money. It's just reallocating people's time. Because in this business, we know if you give people 100 hours to do something that takes 10 hours, they'll spend 100 hours. So the idea yeah. is if you think about, okay, well, they have 100 hours. We need them to be billing 80 of it with the other 20. Where do, where do we invest that? Yeah, uh, where, where can we invest it? Do we have the dollars to invest because we are profitable or we're not as profitable? We need to lean up. So how do we coach them and how do we reallocate their time towards better practices of hunting and farming with the existing customers? Better mm -hmm. practices in the way that we are you know, chasing business to make sure that we're turning down the things that don't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people don't have the filtering system, Filters. you know, like other, organ other industries have where they're really diligent and mm -hmm. what doesn't make sense because their probability of winning is so low. Yeah. And so the labor investment that you make into something, if it's a low probability of winning, you end up can cannibalizing your pipeline. So it's all these things that even I didn't know at a young stage when I first started my first company, you know, it was a craft business and I didn't realize that I never had any of these things until I went through tough times. And yeah, now you understand like, wow, okay, you really need to make sure you're thinking about these things. And you know, coaching your people or finding resources. Again, there's so many out there to help you. Um, but I, I feel like these these two areas, or the organizational effectiveness of the organization or the way the company's running and um, a good, like, I say more growth infrastructure, not just growth strategy or, or sales strategy. I think all around, you need to be thinking of every facet that's, that lives in there and make sure it's sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When you were saying that, it also made me think about the, the element of training the staff to think like through that business lens so that they're actually thinking about the way they're using their time. How is that affecting pro the profitability? All of those elements, I think, become really, especially if you're talking about account people who are going to be both your if you have someone who's both a hunter and a gatherer or, you know, or you have one who's just a hunter, but really understanding the business element. And I think like you can't start that too young, I think, or too early in people's careers, I should say. I think that the more staff really understand their role within the organization and how it affects the organization, I think that that should come part and parcel with the work that you're actually doing on a daily basis. I would agree. I, there's a way to. That's. I would encourage people to to blend that into the L and D parts of the organization. It's not just yeah. learning how to use Mid Journey or Dolly to build out storyboards. It's also about understanding that as you're spending time on a project, how can you do it as most efficiently as possible? Because that's the way the company makes money, and that's how it affords you as a job. So the more efficient you are in the way that you can get to an idea or the way you can get to completing something and move on to the next thing makes the company more profitable, more importantly, more sustainable, which then allows you and them to have room for career growth. And so I think even at an earlier age, I wouldn't say, you know, very early stage in the company. But if, once someone's been in the industry for a good three to five years, this is a great time to start sprinkling in and exposing people to the to a way of thinking like a business person. It, it doesn't matter what role. I mean, I've right. seen some amazing creative directors who are really good at getting to what needs to be done in a very efficient way. And the the, the appreciation that the rest of the business feels from that it has made those companies just accelerate. You know, the yeah. growth of them has outpaced others. So and I don't want to discredit the service that we provide because I do think creativity and, and again, kind of strategy and solving marketing problems for clients is really, really great work. It, it's just starting now to balance. And this, this to me is when you start to realize you should have it before it gets frothy again, right? It's easy if you, cause if you solve it now, when it gets frothy again, it's going to even be extremely better for you at that point. If you yeah. can do it when it's, bad times as it gets better and revenue hides a lot of problems yeah. a lot of problems i see a yeah. lot of companies that are it'd be you'd be surprised at the the level of revenue they're doing 
and running, you know, well below eight, you know, eight to 10% profitability. And they've got the critical mass, but they are just burning everything out. And it's, it's just, you know, they're, they're getting stuck. And so when they lose one client there, those are the ones that have to cut substantial amounts of staff because they have the course correct too late yeah. in the game, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's more preventative. Yeah. The way I think about it now, it's great to be preventative and you know, start thinking through it now. Yeah. But I think that just as like you just said, it's not about discrediting the services. I think that what can happen is that a lot of times with best intentions, people who can, whether they're a founder of an agency or a leader of an agency, they love the discipline or they love the service. They love working with the clients and solving those problems and being in the trenches and making the magic happen. And then they, there is a lack of time spent on this, the pure foundational business elements that you need to make sure are stable, are running for you, are setting everybody up for success. And then, so I think there has to be this conscious decision for how do you fit in figuring these things out? How do you, and to your point, like, there's no time like the present to figure that out because it's only going to get worse, to, you know, down the line. So, you know, along the way, just as you wouldn't discredit the services side, you also can't discredit and not make time for these elements. And these elements aren't the things that are just for the CFO to worry about or the people person. You know, these are things that all the leaders have to take a vested interest in helping to stabilize and then accelerate. Yeah, I think it's a good point. We we do a lot of work with emerging leaders. So I get to see people who progress, you know, through the years and the ranks and and I could tell you the ones who have a bit more understanding of the business. I, I think there's also a very misunderstanding that people say, I don't want to learn about the business because I don't care about finances. And we're not I'm not talking about finances. I'm just talking about how to be effective, as effective as you can in the work you do because it makes the company more sustainable, which then helps you, yeah. right? And, and the ones who, no matter where they are, if they're manager level or director level or, you know, VP level or an executive, you know, committee, the, the ones who have a great craft and at least have some base level of the business that you're actually in and apply that to your craft, no matter where you sit across the, the, the functional parts of the, of the agency, those are the ones who, to me, surpass the others very quickly because... When, when you're sitting in a room and you're talking to, and I, I always go back to, you know, I feel like media teams and account teams probably understand this more, the project management teams. It's you know, a lot of times more of the PR teams or the right. you know, strategic comms teams and the strategist or the creative, like those are the ones that are, that are sometimes kind of anti finances. And I, so I think mm -hmm. if you take finances out of the picture and, and you start to just understand how your role fits into the bigger picture yeah. of the organization and every second you spend has an impact on the organization. So when you're really effective with that one hour you spend on something versus taking you five hours to do something as ineffective, there's a ripple effect. No matter what role you yeah. play, no matter where you are in the hierarchy, whether you're at the top or you're at the bottom, uh, on the front line, right? Every mm -hmm. single hour has an impact if it's spent inefficiently. So if you can think yeah. in every day what you're doing, am I wasting time on things that I can't and be able to share that with the next person? I would say you share with the person next to you and you share with the person above you. That's going to create the affinity that you're paying attention to what this business is about, which I'd love to say it's all about creativity and about the work, but it's about the time. Yeah. As we rent out our hours in different ways, right? But we rent out our hours and get paid for that. So mm -hmm. there's a value to every single hour that someone spends inside that company. doesn't matter what role they're in, no. what department they're in. So if you can understand that and show how you're contributing, do that the most effective way, that's what's going to help you advance in your career. And as you get into leadership roles, it's going to help you understand how to make sure that you're building a sustainable business, whether it be a functional leader of department or the executive committee that's actually running the entire business. It doesn't really matter. So I think that's yeah. the part that we have to focus on as leaders is making it simpler for everyone in the organization to realize that the business side is not finance. It's not money. Exactly. And, and if you can yep. help do that, I think it neutralizes it to people to say, okay, how can I be the most effective at what I'm doing? Whether I put in a new right. process to be faster 
whether I use a technology that's going to get me there quicker or more effectively or more scalably. So I think those are the three takeaways, right? If you can do it more effectively, mm -hmm. you know, efficient or scale more scalable, that tells yeah. me that you are focused on investing your time the most valuable way you can. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And the other element of that is as a leader, I think that we've come along and we've learned a lot over time, but we also have to remember that the people coming up, maybe they don't have that or haven't had that business lens before. So I'm saying that because there's been countless times where I'll pause and explain somebody just part of the way that I mentor people, I'll give them the why yeah. of why we're doing this, why I'm asking. It's like, and the response is like, oh, oh, wow. Like I didn't really realize that or I didn't know how that worked or nobody's ever explained that to me. So I right. think that we really have to just make sure that along the way we are doing, you talked about this earlier, the mentoring of staff, part of retaining staff, developing staff. These are elements that we're actually teaching them. It's about teaching them the business of the business. Yeah. I, there's this concept <laughs> called return on capital, right? And so whether you are spending a dollar on something and you want to make sure it returns a certain amount of money on you. And I think if intellectual capital is the same. So if I've got a person, if I can invest an extra 30 minutes in them, but I know that 30 minutes is going to make them 15% more efficient in their job, yeah. the return on my 30 minutes of capital is substantial, right? Mm -hmm. And if you start looking at that at a compound effect across the entire agency, if everybody's doing that, how more effective and how more scalable sustainable growth, profitability comes in, all these things start to happen. And so uh, to me, no matter what decision you're making it in, in the organization, think about the return on capital. So mm -hmm. even if I'm going to hire a person because I think it's going to solve something, what is the return on that capital? And then set you know guardrails for it. A lot of times people in this industry, I feel like make decisions on hope that they believe it's going to do something because they, they have a gut reaction and I always feel that you should be plotting it towards a return on investment or return on capital or however you want to position it. So when you make these decisions, it's very clear what the expectation is on the financial commitment or the intellectual capital commitment you make to something that should yield a result. Yeah. Um, and so I think this is the, the next layer when it comes to just teaching everybody in the organization to think this way. So again, I don't think it's running people through business school and if they don't have a- no. Know, an educational background that supports um, business, don't hire them. It's more mm -hmm. of can we take some of that thinking and bring it into yeah. this industry and help people understand the importance of it because it's going to advance their career, it's going to advance yeah. their department, it's going to invest the organization. And I think that's the way we should be thinking because it frees up time and money mm -hmm. to keep experimenting. And that's what we all love to do. Yeah. Experiment with new creativity, experiment with new technologies, experiment with new markets, new customers. We love that. But you need the freedom. You need money and you need time. Do it. Yeah. So do the things that the byproduct is you get to experiment more, not just try to experiment more at, at all cost. Mm -hmm. I always think that this return on capital is like such a critical uh, tool that you can help people understand every hour you spend, every dollar you spend has to have a return. What is it? Mm -hmm. Even if someone just did that and started asking people that question, it would change the dynamic of the thinking in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are the kinds of things that happen. Yeah. It's so really interesting too, because I think that sometimes when people hear this kind of thing, they get really worried about the impact on the culture that it's going to have. Well, now all of a sudden, if everything's about the business and then it's going to not be as fun or we're not going to be able to, or it's going to limit our creativity and things like that. So what do you have to say to that? I mean, how are you seeing, are you seeing examples out there of people finding a way to blend both in, in seamless ways or what's your, what's your answer to the culture element? It's a, it's a, it's a balance, right? Well, that's, that's wrong. It's a dance. So there are times when you can have the most fun, be the most creative, you know, the, the money or the time is there in the bank to be able to do all those amazing things. And there's time when it's not there. Mm -hmm. So so to me, it's about understanding what state are you in? Yeah. Is the company in a state, and I've seen a lot of companies crash and burn because they continue to overinvest to believe that culture was everything. And mm -hmm. in a downturn, 
they didn't have the money to maintain that lifestyle. Yeah. And when that lifestyle was outspending the revenue, they had to cut 50% of the staff. And when you do things like that, the, the net effect to the culture is far more damaging oh. than yeah. it has to say, you know what? We got to tighten up the purse a little bit. Um, yeah. Let's make sure when we're making decisions on, on spending time or money on something, what is the actual return we're going to get? And let's green light the things that have return on investment for us until we get through this tough time. So I think the issue isn't whether it will affect the culture. It's the fact that it's going to affect the culture one way or another. Can you just oh. limit the time? Right. Can you set the expectations like, okay, the next six months, we're going to invest in these kinds of things only. Mm -hmm. the, the ideas that we believe are going to have the best return on capital of our intellectual capital time or the best return on investment for the dollar we spend, we get the most out of it. To me, that shouldn't disrupt the culture to believe that it's all about mm -hmm. the bottom line. It's not. Or being selective right. in the way that you are going to make investments. And, and anybody yeah. should think this way. You know, if you're going to, even if you spend your own time at home on something, you'd want to invest it into something you believe is going to yield something for you. Mm -hmm. Unless you're sitting on the couch watching TV because you need to veg out. That's okay. But you can't do that all the time, right? Yeah. So, so to me, your life and your and the business runs very similar is the fact that I want to get a value out of the, the money I put into something or the time I put into something. And so yeah. everybody thinks this way. It's not going to affect the culture. It might slow it down for a little bit, but mm -hmm. if your true culture is rooted in some really amazing belief and purpose, in order for you to maintain that purpose, you have to be selective in what you do. Right. So whether at some point in time you have to be a bit more selective in what you invest in to maintain that purpose and ensure that it carries on for a hundred years, then you got to do it. Mm -hmm. It's about convincing people how long and what it is. And, and if they can do that, I don't think it affects, I don't see it affect the culture of the people who've done it that way. The people who've just said, our culture is everything. We're going to continue to have these offsites because we do it every single year for 20 years. And it's, you know, it costs a ton of money, but you know what? It, it always feels good for everybody afterwards. And they do it. And then three months later, they're laying off 25% staff because they overspent. You know, it's like, yeah. which one was worse? Clearly to me, the laying off the staff was what worse because they didn't predict yeah. the client was going to go away or, you know, you just don't know. Yeah, don't know. absolutely. I love the way you reference it as a dance because that also is like on a daily basis because it's not just about the offsites and those type of things. But again, you can have that dance going on on a daily basis. You can still be really creative and get into things, but also understand the business acumen element yeah. of it. And to your point, there's going to be some, you know, sometimes when one is dialed up more than the other. And because, and, but, and again, that's just, the flow to be able to maintain, to achieve and maintain a healthy business. And at the end of the day, you and I've talked about this a lot. That's what a lot of it just comes down to is, is it a healthy business? Yeah. And it's a, it is a, um, a bit of a grid, you know, sometimes, you know, time is only one component. So if you've got within a given day, maybe half your team can be focused on the things that are more cultural affecting mm -hmm. to the company, you know, you're, and, and half the team is, completely opposite. They're only doing things that are highly efficient. And, and that blend is what's going to maintain the culture, but also put some rigor in the way that you're not over-investing in things. And you, know, you can split it up over weeks. One week, it's this way. The next week, we, we kind of green light certain you know, projects or certain things that are happening. And this next week, we get a little tighter. And over the course of a month, it blends together that you don't compromise either one. That, to me, is the trick. Mm -hmm. You can't compromise either one of them, no. but you have this and then flow back and forth. Um, and and I, th I see a lot of this also where as people get into, you know, talking about growth again, they think about acquisitions mm -hmm. and realize that sometimes this is a great time when, you know, yes, I want to keep my culture intact, but there might be opportunity to, in, to make my culture better by infusing someone else's culture who maybe isn't doing so well, yeah. right? And I can bring in other people, I can bring in new customers and and so I'm seeing a lot of blending of this as well, because when you have a business that is really good at the return on capital, or again, the return on investment, the way you're running, and another one isn't, when you put those two together, they can be really strong. And so I think that this is another big kind of uh, opportunity that I see people really wanting to do, but not sure how to do it. And mm -hmm. I think I have this, it's the same kind of 
uh, thought process. Like the the use of capital is important, human capital or you know monetary capital. Yeah. So you know this this is another I think window of where you can do some creative things and maintain culture, but grow the business in a way that's that's not just a slow grind. You know. So I love the yeah. the M and A side of things that are also taking place and. The use of when I talk capital, the use of dollars, and how efficient you can be with those use of dollars when you're running a great business, and you've got people, you know, having this dance that's happening to make sure that staying there it puts you in such a great opportunity to gain market share. Yeah. You gain geography, location. You gain new industries, gain new talent mm -hmm. you don't have, because again, the density of this industry I think struggles with running this way, and so and not that I think it's taking advantage of people. Sometimes they that the two heads together can be better than them separate. You know, whether someone yeah. not as strong as a leader in that type of running of the business, but somebody else is, and we put those things together, then you get just some amazing work and some amazing people and businesses that are growing rapidly, even in downturn. Like this is this is a part of it, you know? Yeah, and you were saying earlier that you think that this time period is actually a really good time to be thinking about that. Is that right? Absolutely. I, you know, and again, it's it's not. Some people I think are fearful that it's it, the time to take advantage of people, and I, I think I think the opposite. I feel like there's hmm. there's an opportunity to help people, and yeah. there there are some people who just aren't wired or capable or in a position to do what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if there is another person who is able to do that, and you can find a fair solution for the two of you to come together. That is like one plus one equals five. It's not three, yeah. right? And it, that, yeah. that's the way I think about it. And so a lot of um, things we're seeing now is people going, okay, well, maybe it is the right time. Okay, my valuation might be a little bit lower, but here is this other business that we put these things together. It can be really amazing as long as it's a fair deal for both of us. Mm -hmm. and I think that's kind of the magic when it comes to, to M&A is you, you get a really, anytime it's lopsided that someone really won and someone lost, the deals fall apart. Mm. And so when it's a, a more fair deal and someone's thinking about um, how to be fair and what they want to buy, but also have a fair expectation of what the return on capital is, and they set guidelines for it, you can start to shape kind of these deals where they last. Yeah, my my way of thinking now is always about sustainability. So even right. with an M&A, you might be able to get a great deal in an agency that you're going to acquire but is the founder or are the founders going to be committed on the acquisition? Well, mm. if it's a shit deal for them, most likely not. Right. Which means right. you're not going to see return in the way that you thought because they're going to be checked out or they're going to leave early or they're just going to be coming in and, and then giving very little effort because it wasn't the right balance to the deal. And so when I look at challenging markets, this is the time if you're running a sustainable business and you have access to capital, whether it be... In, and even though lending can be quite expensive now, there's ways to use that lending or to use some of your free cash flow to buy companies because mm -hmm. they, one, are lower in valuation, two, the cash components are a lot less because these are people who either, maybe they're just tied, tired, right? And they want to get out or they really want to be a part of something bigger. Yeah. If you can give them that, there's willing to kind of borrow those things. Like, okay, well, I'm willing to, you know, help this thing grow and put them together, but we can only do it with this amount of cash, but we can then give you more upside or you can kind of play back and forth a bit. Um, and this, this is a bit more in the semantics of deal making, but yeah, and vice versa. If I was sitting as a founder going, okay, do I want to weather this storm by myself? Do I have the, do I want to put this armor on every single day and fight this over the next 12 to 18 months by myself or, or, or us as a company by ourselves? Well, why, you don't have to do that. What if you could, yeah. you know, partner up with someone who's the same size or put two companies together that create a new innovative service that is, you know, um, media worthy and is, gives you some accessibility of, of deal flow and something to take back to your existing customers that wasn't something you were selling before. Like to me, there's, there's so much value in strategic growth, which is, which is M&A. So uh, yeah. I, I, we look at that, you know? Yeah. Okay. I'd also imagine with the amount of like small shops that have popped up all over the place that there's not that all small shops that pop up all over the place are actually sound business uh, models. 
But at the, t- at the same time, I've seen so many people who have been in agency seats and big agencies that are like, I'm going to go create my own thing now. I've learned. I've, And so I, I'm just saying, I think there could be more opportunity now to do some of what you're talking about, where it's almost like combining forces um, and creating that sense of efficiency and scale to some degree. Yeah. You know, in my experience, so it's been, you know, a little over 20 years of being in this industry and watching it. it and it's not forever. It's not a, a ton of time, but you know, even prior, you know, to it, and we talking about 30 years, 40 years, it's, it's always been the case mm-hmm. that people have left and started. Yeah. And there's always more density of smaller, more nimble boutique, in a sense, it's a more boutique approach, uh, agencies. And so that to me always exists. Um, uh-huh. you know, when you, when you look at most markets, it always kind of exists. And there's a couple big, big players and then this mid market and then kind of the smaller ones. And the, the concept of when things are tough, banding together with like-minded people or adjacent services or thinking about a strategic way to band together a few of them makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense yeah. because if, if customers are risk adverse and they want to consolidate their budgets into a, a bigger company, mm-hmm. you have a better chance of maintaining those relationships if you're a bigger company. And, and sometimes yeah. you'd have to do that. And so, you know, mergers, you know, aren't as complicated as people think they are. If you have an expert coaching you and walking you through it, it's it's not as complicated to really bring two, three, four smaller companies together mm-hmm. to be a powerhouse. Um, yeah. It's just what I see the mistake being made. And, and it's and no matter who you bring in, it's not about promoting, you know, us, but you need an outside opinion because you you have a daily job, which is billable hours. And then every hour you take away from your leadership team to try and solve something like a merger strategy or an acquisition strategy, you're doing a disservice to mm-hmm. the function of the business that you have to have. Because again, if we go back to most of them are running inefficiently, yeah. the, the risk of taking the time apart from servicing the customers, trying to win, you know, the, the pipeline of customers coming in, managing the people and retaining that talent because they help attract clients. That that in itself is a lift. Yeah. When you insert something around understanding how to put together a management buyout or try to think about alternative financing so you can merge three companies together. These are highly specialized things that mm-hmm. you want to find somebody from the outside. And depending on your size, you can usually find something that's cost effective to be that outside force to guide yeah. you through it while you keep your eye on the ship and there's somebody kind of helping you along that way for a short or a long period. And as long as you're spending the money and you know that the return on capital is going to triple 10x itself of what you spend on someone helping you, it's the right move. Yeah. Right. If yeah. you go back to the return on capital, if I'm going to spend a hundred thousand dollars for somebody to come in and guide me through merging with a like-minded company. I get to double this company uh, within a matter of 12 months and bring in other talent, bring in other customers, and it's going to yield an extra million dollars of profitability. Of course, I would spend $100,000. It wouldn't be a question because you have economies of scale where you get to have remove redundancies when you put two, two companies together. You know, you get to be more efficient in the way that you're consolidating the business, you get to cross sell services to existing customers. So when you put all that together, getting a, a 10X return on the money you spend is not out of reach. And I would invest in that all day long. You tell me you give me a hundred bucks and, or I give you a hundred bucks, you give me a million back, I'll give it to you every day. <laughs> so this this is the idea I think we have to get uh, these agency you know leaders to be thinking about is that if we have you know, you got your heads down, you have the right infrastructure for growth happening from an organic perspective. You're running a really efficient business and you're, you're using technologies, you're using people, experts to really be efficient in a way that every dollar spent and every hour spent has the best return it can have. And then you plop on some strategic growth through a merger acquisition, whatever the case is, That, that in, those ingredients are where you see the somewhat of a hockey stick growth, um, but not in a way that's, you know, damaging to culture or right. damaging to profitability or damaging to uh, career paths that people want. 
you can do it sustainably and just do it over a three to five year period. You know? Yeah. Creating that stability. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. You need all those ingredients kind of working on top of producing great work for your customers. And I think it's very mm -hmm. possible to do it if you make the time and, and find the people who can really do this well. You know, it's part of the screening process, I think, when you're interviewing people or who you're keeping on the team. The ones that have this kind of thinking in there is who I'd want. Yeah, absolutely. Well, George, you have been so generous to come back again to the show. Thank you for sharing all that you did, having this discussion about agency growth and pain points along the way. Um, folks, I hope that you have really enjoyed the conversation. Um, George is open for you if you want to give him a call, if you want to go through me, go through George directly, talk about some of the solutions um, that he's got going on. Um, but we're, I'm just so glad that you came on today again, because I think now is definitely a time when there's a lot of challenge out there. No, it's my pleasure. And, you know, my effort is more to help expose people to the things that we're seeing are not working and also personal experiences that I've been through and other people on our team. And, and we're just trying to be there for people. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's an important way to, to think about what we're doing. And there's a lot of times I get phone calls and it's not about money at all. You know, there's times where it just makes sense to say, you know what, this is really what you should do. You don't, you don't need us. You don't need a consultant. Just fix this one thing here and you're good, you know? And, and so I want to always, I yeah. always have that open line. I think you and I are, um, someone in the future going to be uh, dropping a, a forum where we can allow these kind of conversations to be more open and, and let people ask questions that we can give some insight and, and, and just be helpful. And that's really what we want. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much, George. Everybody, thanks so much for tuning in and have an awesome day, everybody. Thank you. Take care.